Good morning, and welcome to another episode of Legally Raven, or Legally Ravenhood. Today, we are going to go over my second case brief. So this is about Asahi Metal Industry Corporation versus the Superior Court of California. Uh-oh, California's my school, right? Let's fix that. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. Um, this is the Supreme Court case, and let's talk about how I got there. So on September 23rd, 1978, on Interstate Highway 80 in Solana, California, uh, Gary Zucker lost control of his Honda motorcycle, collided with the tractor. He was severely injured, and unfortunately, his wife, Ruth Ann Marino, was killed. Mm, so sad. So a year later, he filed a product liability action with the Supreme Court but the Superior Court, I'm sorry, the state of California, um, and he alleged that the motorcycle tire lube and sealant were defective. Um, in his complaint, it named um, Changshin Rubber Industrial Corporation, a Taiwanese manufacturer of the tube. And then Changshin, uh, they went in, uh, sorry, let me fix this. They went and filed um, a cross complaint seeking indemnification from its co-defendant and from the petitioner Asahi Metal Industry, who actually made the tire valve, um, sorry, let me fix this, the tire valve assembly. All right, so um, let me just go really quickly, and I forgot to pull this up beforehand, but let's go to the our connected casebook here so that we can see a picture of what this is all about. Um, hold on one second, I'm sorry, I should have remembered, this is where I stopped last time on the video when I realized that I wanted to um, actually uh, just have a picture of what we're <clears throat> talking about here because it's just really helpful. So let's go here into our civil procedure case book and um, let's see, we're gonna keep going here because this is Washington country, this is it. So your authors are not experts on motorcycle tires, so the tire valve may not be exactly the same as the tire valve at the issue in Asahi, but it is a tire valve. So it's hard, hardly a massive import item. A cardboard box might contain 500 of them, each costing about 27 cents. So this may offer some perspective on the extent of a size purposeful availment in the California market. So there you have it. That is what we're talking about here. All right. So now the Superior Court of California, they did not, they uh, denied the motion to quash this. So what happened is, I'm sorry, that everything was settled. Uh, everything with Zucker was settled, and the only thing that was left was this indemnification claim between Changshin and the Taiwanese company, and then Asahi Metal, um, which I believe is a Japanese company, right? So these are the two things. Neither one of them are United States company, right? And neither one of them are in California. Um, but um, Changshin, 20% of its sales were in the state of California. So the Superior Court of California denied the motion to quash the summons, stating that SIE obviously does business on an international scale. So it's not unreasonable that they defend a claim of defect and a product on an international scale because SIE said, hey, like, you don't have PJ, you don't have personal jurisdiction over me. And the Superior Court of California said, yes, we do. So the Court of Appeals of the state of California issued a preemptory writ. A preemptory writ or mandate or uh, mandamus is a judicial writ or order to any governmental body, government official, or lower court requiring that they perform an act or cease to act where the court finds that an official law, duty, or judgment requires them to do so. So the Court of Appeals of the State of California did a preemptory writ of mandate commanding the Superior Court to quash service of summons. The court concluded that it would be unreasonable to require uh, Asahi to respond to California solely on the basis um, of, 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 of for ultimately realized foreseeability that the product into which its component was embodied would be sold all over the world, including California. So Superior Court of California said, hey, <laughs> you play internationally, you pay internationally. The Court of Appeals said, no, 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 no. They had this teeny tire valve that was incorporated into another product that was then sold in California. It is not reasonable to require them to come to court in California. This is, we don't have personal jurisdiction here, right? But then the Supreme Court of California reversed and discharged the writ that the Court of Appeals of the state of California said. The court observed SIE had no office 
property or agents in California, explicits no business in California, has made no direct sales in California. Moreover, Asahi did not desire or control the system of distribution that carried its, um, let me fix that, its valve assemblies into California. Nevertheless, the court found that the exercise of jurisdiction over Asahi to be consistent with the due process clause. It concluded that uh, Asahi knew that some of the valve assemblies were sold to Changshin would be, um, would we uh, incorporate into products um, and then sold in California and they benefited from those sales in California. So the court felt that Asahi's um, intentional act of placing its components into the stream of commerce and its awareness that some components would eventually find their way into California was sufficient to form a basis for state court jurisdiction under the due process clause. So they granted, how do you pronounce this? A certiorari, a writ or order by which the higher court were reviews the decision of a lower court and they not reverse it. So let's just <clears throat> get the uh, pronunciation. And I'm sorry, I keep calling it uh, Asai and then Asai, uh, uh, Asahi. I'm not sure how you pronounce um, the that company there. I'm sorry, I don't speak Japanese. So let's just look at this word. And I think we looked it up before, but let's look it up just one more time here because we like to do that here. So we learn how to pronounce things correctly. Certiorari. 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 All right. A writ of a superior court to call upon records of an inferior court or body acting at a quasi-judicial capacity. Certiorari. 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 All right, perfect. So now we have that certiorari. All right, so here we have it. So the Supreme Court of California would not quash it. They said we have personal jurisdiction. The Court of Appeals in the state of California said we do not have personal jurisdiction. The Supreme Court of the state of California said we have jurisdiction. Um, now, what is the Supreme Court of the United States? Um, uh, the United States say, well, now that we've talked about the facts in the case, let's go to the issue. So this really is about the stream of commerce. So the stream of commerce theory is addressed in this case. Does California long arm statute authorize the exercise of jurisdiction on any basis not inconsistent with the constitution of the US? So if this is not inconsistent with the constitution of the US, does that mean that the state in this case, California, can use this long arm statute to pull um, this international company into court, okay? Uh, this Japanese company, right? So some of the rules that were used in this case are, um, we have the Burger King, the uh, Ruzowicz, which was a contract case, but it talked about, you know, personal jurisdiction um, from a breach of contract. We have worldwide Volkswagen, where the court rejected the assertion that a consumer's unilateral act to bring in the defendant's product into the form state was sufficient constitutional basis for PJ or personal jurisdiction. And then Hansen v. Dinkler, where minimum context must have a basis in some act by which the defendant purposely avails itself to the privilege of conducting activities in the form state, thus invoking benefits and protections of its law. And then also Humble V2 Automotive Company, which I need to look right up. So those are some of the rules that were used here. So now let's just talk about the analysis. The Supreme Court said the due process clause of the 14th Amendment requires something more than the defendant was aware that his products entry into the forum state through the stream of commerce. So, and it talked about Humble V Toyota. It said to make this Japanese company come to the United States would be manifestly unjust to have to defend here. It said that minimal a minimum connection requires, or no, I think requires a substantial connection. So um, an action of the defendant purposefully directed towards the forum state. So placement of a product in the stream of commerce without more is an act of the defendant, without more is not an act the defendant purposefully directed toward the forum state. So um, the Japanese company, uh, Asahi was not trying to avail itself to the California market because they had no office, no agents, no employees, no property in California, did not create or control or employ the distribution system that brought itself into California, did not design this product in anticipation of sales in California, so it doesn't have it. So then it went to be about fair play and substantial justice. 
So in this case, it was unreasonable to assertion of jurisdiction over SIE, even apart from the question of placement of goods in the stream of commerce. Certainly the burden of a defendant in the case is severe. They have been commanded by the Supreme Court of California, not only to, to traverse the distance from the SIE's headquarters in Japan to the Superior Court in California and for the and, um, for the county of Solano, but also to submit its dispute with Chang Shen to a foreign national judicial system. The burden of defending oneself in a foreign legal system should have significant weight and asserting the reasonableness of stretching the long arm of personal jurisdiction over uh, national borders, in this case, stretching it internationally. And then California doesn't really have a legitimate interest in this because this really isn't about the safety of a product, it's really about an indemnification issue. So California doesn't really have a, an interest in protecting its citizens through this case. So um, the judgment of the Supreme Court California was uh, reversed. Uh, Justice O'Connell took the lead in this case. It was remanded for further proceedings and not inconsistent with the opinion because the facts of the case did not establish minimum context. Um, such that an exercise of personal jurisdiction is consistent with fair play and substantial justice. So we did have some dissenters. Ultimately, um, they agreed, but many people thought that basically the only thing, many of the judges felt that the only thing you really need to focus on was the B part. The fact that it just was unreasonable um, for a California court to uh, exert personal jurisdiction over a defendant in Japan over an indemnification case. So they really felt like the, the part A, which dealt with minimum contacts, it's not really necessary for the court's decision and therefore it really shouldn't have been concluded. But ultimately the Supreme Court decided that mm -mm, this is not a United States issue. This is not a California issue. This needs to be handled in another court. It is going beyond due process in the 14th Amendment to call the Japanese company to litigate a case with foreign law all the way from Japan to California. And that is my second case brief. I need to go back and check this sentence and make sure that this is supposed to be connection and not context, because this might be an error. I need to check. Anyway, thank you for tuning in to today's episode of Legally Now What? Legally Way with Bear. See you next time. Bye.